Today on Outdoor Oklahoma, bird watching is a great activity for you and your family. Learn tips to identify and attract birds to your yard. Then we'll visit one of the most popular venues each year at the Wildlife Expo, right now on Outdoor Oklahoma. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead and today I'm in a city park doing a little birding and well, you'll have to pardon the pun, but I'm just winging it because I really don't know what I'm doing. I've always been fascinated though by people that were very knowledgeable in bird identification. And if you have too, well, today's show is going to be really interesting because we're going to hook up with Gina Donnell, our wildlife diversity specialist at the wildlife department. And she's going to take us step by step through bird watching 101. Today we're talking about bird watching. If you're interested in picking up a new hobby or just like to watch birds from your backyard feeder, maybe you're even wanting to help out with a citizen science winter bird feeder survey project, here's a few tips for attracting more birds to your property. Food is an important habitat component, so one easy way to draw birds into your property is to set up a backyard feeding station. There's several different types of feeders that you can get at any retail store. Um, so we've got the traditional hopper style feeder here. One benefit of it is that you can get a lot of food in here and not have to worry about the weather. Um, but wind might be a, a factor and scatter some of the seeds. Um, you're also going to be able to attract a lot of different sizes of birds with this feeder. If you're really just interested in the smaller birds, um, a tube feeder might be the best bet. You can uh, see there's, there's several different perches here and it kind of limits maybe a, a red-bellied woodpecker coming in and getting food from this type of feeder. There's also some specialized feeders. Uh, we've got a uh, thistle feeder that a lot of uh, people will use to attract American goldfinches. Uh, for food, we recommend just using black oil sunflower seed. Um, a lot of birds prefer this simple food um, and that way you're not going to waste a lot of the other, other seeds that are in there. So you don't have to buy your feeder at a store. There's several things around the house that'll make great bird feeders. And they even make great uh, family crafts. Uh, the first thing that you can do is take an old toilet paper tube and uh, just use some peanut butter. I've got crunchy peanut butter here. And we're just gonna smear the, the peanut butter along the tube. And we're gonna fully coat it. Um, and then we're going to take our black oil sunflower seeds. And we're just gonna sprinkle the, the seeds on our tube so that it's fully covered. And then I've uh, got a, a string here and we'll just uh, tie this to the tree and it'll be a great treat for chickadees and titmice and all of that. So another thing that I've done, I've taken a, uh, an old milk carton and kind of upcycled it. I've cut four holes uh, for the, the twigs that are gonna be our perches. And then right above them, I've uh, drilled four other holes. Um, and so we're just going to fill this up with our black oil sunflower seed. And we're gonna fill it all the way to the top. And then the birds will, will have a, a great treat. All right, so now we're ready to hang up all of our bird feeders. Um, definitely recommend using different styles and hanging them at staggering heights. Some birds really like to feed low uh, or on the ground and some birds prefer to be up high. Um, if you have a, a unique setup for your bird feeders or you have a great recipe for, or a mixture for your seeds, we'd love to hear about it. Find me on Facebook. Mm -hmm. 
Now let's talk about some of the equipment that can make bird watching a little bit easier. Um, the one thing you might want to consider investing in is just a good pair of binoculars. They're really helpful when you're in the field and uh, a bird is just a little bit outside of, of range so they can help pick up a few subtleties. Um, you don't need to go all out and get a, a very expensive pair of binoculars. Some can, can be thousands of dollars. You might be able to pick up a pair at a, a garage sale. Um, just make sure they're, you've got a clear vision um, and, and they'll be really helpful in the field. Another thing you, you might invest in is a copy of a field guide. Um, there's several different options. You can get some with uh, photographs, you can get some with illustrations. Um, we recommend you get the full version instead of an eastern or a western field guide because we have several different birds in Oklahoma um, and a, a good mixture there. Uh, there's also some references you can get at a local library. Uh, this book even has uh, different uh, flowers or, or plants that'll be attractive to wildlife and even has some uh, diagrams for uh, putting up a bird feeder or putting up a, a birdhouse. Um, if you're interested in doing more landscaping for wildlife, make your, your property a little more attractive to wildlife. Um, we've got the Landscaping for Wildlife book that the Department of Wildlife offers. Um, it goes through and talks all about um, different water features to put in. It talks about uh, butterflies and, and how to make your property more attractive there. So you can get this copy of Landscaping for Wildlife through the outdoor store. One thing that I like to do is keep a journal or a log of all the birds that I see. Um, there's some great journals out there. You can just use a, a plain piece of paper. Um, but this particular journal lets me write down some of the, the birds that I've seen each day, but it also has a, a place to make some drawings or, or make a few notes. So I could put um, some funny story that happened while I was out birding or, or talk about the different people that joined me. Um, so it's just a great way to, to remember the time in the field and, and keep a good log. Um, some people might even actually want to keep a, a life list of all the birds that they've seen. Um, so it's a great way to uh, keep track of the birds. Um, if you are wanting to join us with the Citizen Science Winter Bird Feeder Survey, um, it's also important to write down what birds you see. We have a form on the website. Um, just download the form and uh, it goes through and asks you a couple different questions, but then it, it gives you a place to write down the number of birds that you saw. So the winter bird feeder survey is uh, typically in the first couple weeks in January. Look uh, at wildlifedepartment.com for more information. When you first spot a bird, there are a few things to look for that can help in identification. First, what are the size and shape of the bird? Is it large like a crow, medium sized like a robin, or is it smaller like a chickadee? Does it have a long tail or maybe an oddly shaped bill? Next, look for colors and patterns. Does it have a black cap or maybe a yellow rump? Does it have any contrasting colors on the wings or, or on the tail? Behavior is another identification clue. Does it stay perched and bob its tail or is it more busy and acrobatic? Finally, look for the habitat. Did you find it at the top of a tree or was it perfectly fine being on the ground? Did you see it in the prairie or in a woodland? Answering these simple questions can help narrow your identification to a few birds. To get further than that, you'll need to pay more attention to things like bill color or the number of bars found on the wings. Now let's look at some of the birds most commonly reported during the winter bird feeder survey. American goldfinch are a feeder favorite. During spring and summer, the males can be rapidly identified by their bright yellow feathers, black cap, and black and white wings. But during winter, the birds are much more drab. While the wings remain black and white, the yellow fades to a butter color around the face and throat. They have a conical bill and a notched tail. Next up is the house sparrow. Though native to Europe, it has spread across the United States since its initial release in 1851. House sparrows can be identified by their chunky body, short tail, and stout bill. Males have a gray head, black bib, and striped back. Northern cardinals are another backyard favorite. Males are a bright red, while females have more brown tones. Both have a noticeable crest, long tail, and bright orange bill. Red-winged blackbirds visit feeders across the state. Males are glossy black and have red and yellow wing patches. Females are streaky brown. These birds have a sharply pointed bill and often congregate in large numbers underneath hanging feeders. Dark-eyed juncos are a common backyard bird. 
Most are slate gray on top with a white belly, but color is variable. They are medium-sized sparrows and have a short, stout bill. They can be easily identified by their white outer tail feathers seen in flight. Learn how to identify other birds that may visit your feeder this winter at wildlifedepartment.com. Hey, if that segment just flew by for you a little too fast, well, you can catch each one of those individual segments on our YouTube channel. Just search Outdoor Oklahoma channel on YouTube. You know, Gina also mentioned that she's got a Facebook page, and I'd really encourage you to like the page and follow along with her as she explores and discovers Oklahoma's wildlife diversity. Hey, coming up after this week's Outdoor News Report, we're going to visit one of the most popular venues every year at our Wildlife Expo. Well, at our Wildlife Expo each year in September, one of the most popular events is the Bluebird Make and Take booth. Now, it's popular with adults and kids alike, and really building a Bluebird box is pretty straightforward and easy. It's also a great bonding experience for your family that can last for many years. Hello, my name is Mike Porter. I'm from the Noble Foundation. I'm one of the volunteers today at the Oklahoma Park Wildlife Conservation Eastern Bluebird Make and Take. We, what we do is we give a little presentation about eastern bluebirds, their ecology, why we make the boxes, and how, how to manage the boxes, and, and how to make the boxes. And then we get and make one box for each family that attends the event. All right, so we have cedar right here. This is our defense panel planks. And we just cut them up to match the descriptions on our plans right here. And uh, you guys can take some of these plans home if you want to build more bluebird boxes. So this is going to be our back panel. And then this short piece, that'll be our floor right here. And these are going to be our sides, the front, and the roof. So you want to get one of those and put on each side. Yeah, just like that. There you go. I'll hold that for you and get the other side. Now the important thing to remember is you got to have one. Which side do you want to be the door? This side? That side? Okay, so we need to move that down just a hair right there. So you want to put, get the front piece. Which piece do you want to be on the front? It's smooth? Yeah. Okay. So we'll set that right there. And now that we got that, we're going to drill our first hole and we'll put a screw here and one screw there, one right there, and then we'll flip it over and we'll put the back on it. Several different songbirds use this, Eastern Bluebird, Carolina Chickadee, Tufted Titmouse, several wren species, Prothonotary Warblers. These are all native birds that live in cavities. And, and cavities normally would occur in dead trees we call snags. And those have been in decline as we clear the forest and people don't realize the value of dead trees and cut them down. And, and we're replacing that habitat or substituting that habitat with these nest boxes. We have an acre and a half of land and we're trying to place them around the property away from each other where they can't really see each other but help those bluebirds out so we so we're seeing yeah. connect the floor to the front yeah there you go no that's perfect there we go Yeah, we, sometimes the other birds fight with them over the houses and they're pretty non-aggressive so if we don't help them out and try to shoo the other birds away, they usually lose the fight. So it, we, 
if we check the nest and if we see a lot of trash and stuff in the nest, then we know it's not a bluebird nest and we'll take it out. And then hopefully the bluebirds will come back and try again. So we try to help them. All right, so we got our box. Now we just need to put the back on. Which side do you want to do the back? Like this? So it look like that? All right. So you want to make sure you put the box about in the middle of your backboard so that you can attach it to a tree, a post, or something like that. So we will drill, since this is our door, we're going to only put one up here and we'll put two on this side. So, yeah, about right there. The best place to place a nest box is on a post, not, not part of a fence, not a tree, not a building, an independent, like I usually, generally use a T-post, then I slip a piece of PVC or metal conduit over the top of it, and I like to place it outside the drip line of the trees, at least eight foot away from woody. I like to put it next to a tree or a shrub. The bluebirds or the chickadees like to nest, like perch on the tree or shrub to hunt insects and survey the territory. But if you put it under or too close to something, it will allow the snakes and the squirrels and the cats, raccoons, to climb into the box. So we try to place the top of the box at least eight feet away from any woody plant or fence or building or something like that. Now it's okay to check the boxes once a week. Uh, in fact, I, I kept records for 20 years on the birds we flushed out of the boxes and the ones we didn't flush, it would make no difference on nesting attempts. So, so it's okay to check them once a week, you're not going to hurt the nesting attempt. And if you do that, if you'll check it, you can monitor the boxes when that nest is complete, you pull the old nest out, and I average two and a half nesting attempts in southern Oklahoma in the same box. So, so you know, you can take the nest and check them once a week. And it's a lot of fun and people enjoy seeing it. So. Uh, when they, they build the nest, they lay one egg a day. Uh, bluebirds generally lay four to six eggs, an average of five on the first nesting attempt, and four on the successive nesting attempts. They're pale blue most of the time, about 10%, 10 or 15% of the time they're cream, about the size of my little thumbnail. And they lay one egg a day, and then they incubate for 13 to 16 days. And then the fledglings take 15 to 20 days to fledge and leave the nest. Yes. And once they all leave the nest, you can pull the old nest out, they don't like to build on the old nest. They will occasionally, but they don't like it because it builds up mite loads and parasite loads inside the nest. So it's best to pull the old nest out and they'll start another nesting attempt. In southern Oklahoma, nesting season starts on the average of March 8th, but it can start as early as late January or as late as yeah. early April. It depends on the winter and the spring. Uh, as you move north in the state, nesting season starts at a later date as you move northern in the state. Now our nesting season in southern Oklahoma finishes in late July, early August. Now they will attempt nest after that, but none of those nests are successful because it's too hot. They simply die. Okay, so we've got our front, our back, our sidewall, and our door right here. And because we only put two screws at the top, we can open it up and check on our nests whenever we get the chance to. We've got one, two, three, four screws on the front and then one, two, three, four screws on the back holding it together. So that's how we're looking right now. Now what we have left to do is to put our roof on like that. And then we gotta put this important piece right here. This is the predator guard. And we put that on the front and that way cats and mice and other animals can't reach in there and get the bluebird eggs. You don't want them to be under the trees where predators can get into the box easier or snakes can drop down and get onto the box. So near trees but not, not right next to the trees. Um, and they need to be far enough away that the bluebirds don't see each other, don't realize the other one's there. So I mean they like to be at least 100 feet apart, 100 yards apart. About right there. When you're putting the top of the roof on, you got to make sure when you put the credit guard on, you don't you won't have a screw right here in the hole because we're gonna drill that out later. That makes sense. Yep. We'll put one just right about there. Yeah. Yes. Alright. We can put these screws in. Alright, bud.
Um, he's like helping the bluebirds and trying to help the wild. We know because the bluebirds are a non-aggressive bird, they have had a tough time making a go of it because they keep getting shoot out of their, their nesting spot. So we're trying to help repopulate the bluebird population. They were in decline for a long time, so we like the bluebirds. They're they're a pretty bird. Mm -hmm. Very so, pretty. Yeah, trying to help them out. All right. Perfect. All right. So now we have our bluebird box with the door. All we need to do is come over here to the drill stations and we'll drill out this hole so the bluebirds can actually use it. Come build nest boxes and help the birds. The, come to the expo, you can get a free nest box, at least the first 25 families at each of these programs. The best time to come to one of these programs is the first one in the morning at 9 o'clock. That one's usually not full. After that, all the programs are full. But if you want to get a nest box, you need to come about an hour or two early and get a sticker so that you can build a nest box. But if you miss out, because we have a limited number of nest boxes and spaces in the programs, the plans are online and you can get online. It's a fun project with the kids or fun just for, by yourself to, to build some nest boxes at home and put them out and try to encourage our native birds that have any nests. Man, I wish Gina was here to tell me what kind of bird that was. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us today. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.